moving on to President Woodrow Wilson and America's entrance into World War I. And we'll start that out with a profile of President Wilson, but I want to kind of mention a couple things first. Is America's entrance into World War I does not happen at the beginning. This World War begins in Europe. And then we try our best to stay out of it, but eventually cannot. Okay? And we'll kind of get into that. But the man that inherits this issue is Woodrow Wilson, and so we're going to tell you a little bit about this president. Keep in mind, remember, he defeated in the election of 1912 both the incumbent president, William Howard Taft, and fairly popular Theodore Roosevelt by a landslide victory. And remember, if you go all the way back to Lincoln and the Civil War, Woodrow Wilson is only the third Democratic president since the Civil War. Okay? So the Republicans have had a pretty good run on the White House. Woodrow Wilson wins as a Democrat by a large margin and is now President of the United States. So we'll tell you a little bit about this guy. Now listen carefully. Thomas Woodrow Wilson was born on December 29, 1856 in Virginia. Thomas Woodrow Wilson was born on December 29, 1856 in Virginia. Now his family did not live in Virginia long. They actually moved to Georgia, which means they were on what side in the Civil War? Confederate side. Okay? And matter of fact, when Woodrow Wilson, or Thomas Woodrow Wilson at this point, when he was growing up in his formative years in Georgia, it was during the reconstruction of the Civil War. So you can imagine what things looked like in Georgia at the time. Okay? Now as I mentioned, uh, they were Southerners. Wilson's father was a minister. And as a result of that, he grew up on a daily diet of prayer and Bible readings. Okay? So his father was a minister. So Thomas Woodrow Wilson grew up on a daily diet of prayer and Bible readings. As I mentioned, during the Civil War, Wilson's father supported the South. And he even used his church as a hospital during the Civil War to help work on wounded Confederate soldiers. So during the Civil War, Wilson's father supported the South. He set up his church as a hospital for wounded Confederate soldiers. Now, like a lot of kids his age, he didn't even start formative school until he was nine years old because of the Civil War. There were no schools. The North ruined them all, right? So who taught him his first nine years of life? Actually, his father did. Actually, his father did. So he was taught at home by his father until he was nine because there were no schools for him to go to during the Civil War. Once the Civil War ended, he continued his formative education. He went to elementary school, and then he went to high school, then he graduated. And then after his graduation from high school, he enrolled at Princeton University in 18... Excuse me, he enrolled at Princeton University and graduated in 1879. Now, Princeton University is a very prestigious Ivy League school, so he's very bright. So he graduates from high school, he enrolls at Princeton University, and he graduates from Princeton University in 1879. Anybody know what state Princeton's in? New Jersey. Now, after he graduated from Princeton University, he went to graduate school. Now, I had to go to graduate school to earn my master's degree in guidance and counseling and secondary school administration, 6 through 12. You have to go get a master's. You get a master's at graduate school, school past college. And he went to graduate school at John Hopkins, just like it sounds, H-O-P-K-I-N-S. He went to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, which again is a pretty prestigious graduate school. So he graduates from Princeton in 1879, and he enrolls in graduate school at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And he gets his master's degree in history and political science. It's his master's degree in history and political science. 
And it was there that he wrote the first of several books, which was entitled Congressional Government, A Study in American Politics. So at John Hopkins University, Wilson studies history and political science. He writes his first book, which was entitled Congressional Government, A Study in American Politics. I just gave that book to Caitlin. She's going to pass it around so you can see what it looks like. Well, after he graduates from John Hopkins University and gets his upper level degree, he returns to Princeton University. And what does he do there, Jaden? Teaches, becomes a college professor there. Very good. He teaches history and political science at Princeton University as a college professor. And he's very, very successful as a college professor there. And he's so successful that the Board of Trustees give him what job? President, President of Princeton University. Very good. So after his graduation from John Hopkins University, he returns to Princeton University as a college professor, teaching history and political science. In 1902, because of his success as a professor, Wilson is named president of Princeton University. That's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal to be the president of Princeton. He was named president of Princeton in 1902. Now, Bigger schools refer to the vice principal or the assistant principal as the dean of students. Kind of the same thing. So a dean of students in a high school, I bet they call it the dean of students probably like Casper and Trump. I don't know. But anyway, a dean of students is someone that takes care of student affairs, discipline attendance, those types of things. Even at the college level, they have dean of students who does the same thing, although discipline is a little different in attendance in college because they don't care if you come or not, right? And the discipline, if you get yourself in, you know, if you're tardy, they don't care. The professor takes care of that. But if you get yourself in trouble on campus, that type of thing, you have to go to the dean of students, who works with students in academics and discipline, etc. Well, there was a dean of students at Princeton University by the name of Andrew West. And President Wilson, that would be the president of Princeton, had a hard time getting along with the dean of students, Andrew West. They did not get along very well. And it all came to a head when Woodrow Wilson wanted to start a graduate program at Princeton. His philosophy is, gee whiz, you know, I went to Princeton University, then I had to go to John Hopkins University to get my graduate degree. Why don't we start a graduate school right here at Princeton so our, you know, our graduates can stay here and continue to be at Princeton and we can make the money? So we wanted to start a graduate school program at Princeton. The problem was Andrew West did not spoke out against Wilson's graduate program. So again, there was another issue of those fellows not getting along with each other. So while President Woodrow Wilson of Princeton University wanted to start a graduate program or a graduate school at Princeton so they could keep their students there and maybe attract students from other schools, Andrew West, the dean of students, opposed it. And they were going like this for a while. Well, that all came to a head. Because Andrew West, quote, had the ear of a very wealthy alumnus. Now, David, what's that mean if, if someone has the ear of a very wealthy alumnus? I'll just rephrase that. If I have the ear of a specific school board member as teacher, what do I have, David? A man is like a friend. Or something. Well, he's kind of a friend that I can voice my opinions to that he might, you know, either sublimately or break or aggressively give my opinion to the board on something. If you have the ear of somebody, that's pretty good because they'll listen to you. You have a good relationship. You communicate well. You have something going, okay? Well, it just so happened that Andrew West had the ear of a very wealthy alumnus. That's someone that has graduated and gone on and done well in life. And what happened is this wealthy alumnus said that when he died, he was going to leave a large sum of money from his will to Princeton University. That's not uncommon. I have in my will that when I die, a certain percentage of my wealth is going to be given to Rocky Mountain College in Billings. Okay? That, matter of fact, the college even kind of promotes that among alumni, which you like to include us in your will. Some do, some don't. Well, this guy made it public, this wealthy alumnus, that I'm going to give a large amount of money to Princeton University in my will when I die 
under one condition. Think about what we're talking about. What's got to happen? No gospel. Well, not worse. That's a good guess. And the other class would say worse than well, more more than that. Wilson is fired, and West takes over. That was what the guy said. The guy said, "I am going to. I'm willing to leave a large, substantial amount of money to Princeton University when I die in my will, if." President Wilson is removed and Dean of Students Andrew West takes his place. Now, what would the normal person do in Woodrow Wilson's shoes? Do you think the normal person would do that? No. Offer a bigger amount of money. What's that? Yeah, you were unbelievable. Most people would hunch up, get mad, and dig in. As Caitlin so graciously stated, because Wilson went to Princeton, taught at Princeton, and now was the president of Princeton, he had a tremendous love for the university, and he thought it'd be in the best interest of the college and the students that the college served to resign. And that's what he did. He was very unselfish, and he said, you know what, I'm going to do what I think is best for the students, faculty, alumni, etc., of Princeton University, and if, by God, if this guy is going to make a boast, that he's going to give a large sum of money if I resign, let's make him give it to us. Because it's going to benefit the kids. I thought that was incredibly unselfish on his part. So he resigns as president of Princeton. West takes over. And Wilson then makes the decision to enter politics. I guess you're thinking good today. I like that. Now, let me, let me ask you this. What pretty important position might he run for that he's got a little clout? Because where has he been most of his career? Princeton University. Where is it located? So what might be a position? He's going to run for governor of New Jersey. And because of his popularity, because of what he's offered to Princeton University in the state of New Jersey, he runs successfully for governor of New Jersey. So he leaves Princeton, enters politics, and is elected governor of New Jersey. Now, we know that because of his successes as governor of New Jersey, we don't think you really have to write this down, that he gained the Democratic nomination for president in 1912, and because of the split in the Republican Party in 1912, he wins a landslide victory to become president of the United States, and as I mentioned earlier in the class, he becomes the first president, excuse me, the third Democratic president <coughs> since the Civil War, only the third. Now, something you should write down is he came into the presidency after he was inaugurated with few strings attached. Nick, what's that mean if you have few strings attached? He walks into the presidency with few strings attached. Okay, if Naya was struggling to get into my senior class next year because her GPA was bad or whatever, I'd say, Naya, I'll let you in but you got to buy ice cream bars for me once a week. She would come into my class with strings attached. You see what I mean? In order to get into this class, she had to do that. In other words, President Wilson owed nothing to anyone. No favors, nothing. He came in not having to please any particular group who maybe donated a lot of money to his campaign or any of that type of thing. He came with very few strings attached. That's not normally the situation when a president comes in. Unfortunately for him, less than two years after his inauguration, war breaks out in Europe. And that will be our next subtopic. Europe enters into a world war. Who is that? Woodrow Wilson? Mm -hmm. hey, you should know some of this, right? All right. Let me ask you a question, historians. And you're almost getting to be historians. You'll be historians on about May 20th of next year. But anyway, uh, uh, potential historians, when's the last time Europe experienced a major war? What? This is World War One, dear, so we haven't got there. Oh, I thought you meant like... No, when's the... No, I'm talking about... Yeah, it's a good thing. As of, as of this time in, in, in history, by 1914, what was the last war? Nope. Spanish? The Spanish-American War was fought in Cuba, so that really wasn't the European War. 
No, you're, you're, you're thinking too much. You're closer, though. What did the, where did the British fight last? France or America. War of 1812. Okay, so the last, Europe, the last war a European country was in ended in 1815. And that was the War of 1812. So I want you to think about this. Between 1850, the end of the War of 1812, and 1914, where we're at now, Europe had not experienced a major war. They went 99 years without a major war in Europe. And it wasn't until the summer of 1914 that people were horrified when five major European countries went to war. Five European countries are going to go to war here. That's going to be the summer of 1914. They couldn't quite make it 100 years, but they made it 99 years without a major war in Europe. Now, there's a reason why these people were so worried, because guess what happened in the last 99 years? Progress. Technology got better. All of a sudden now they're horrified because, because of modern technology, which you might consider primitive, in 2018, but was major technological advantages. It's going to make it much easier now, in the last 99 years, for one human being to kill another. Okay? So the point I'm making is that they had 99 years to get technology going. And by 1914, the development of modern technology would greatly enhance the ability of one human being to kill another. That's why World War I is going to be like no other war that had ever been experienced in world history. And I'm going to give you six examples of modern technology in 1914 that enhanced the ability of one human being to kill another. And you're going to think these are kind of primitive, but these were big things. Anybody want to guess what some of the modern examples? Airplanes. Absolutely, airplanes. Now they were not in the, they were a little bit in the primitive stage because this is 1914, right? When did Orville and and his brother make the airplane famous right after the turn of the century. So they're, but they're going to be a factor. Airplanes. What else might have been developed? Machine guns. Very good. Machine guns. Rapid fire machine guns. Certainly going to enhance the ability of one human being to kill another. What else might you think? Not yet. What do you say? Tanks. Very good. Your tanks. So we have. Machine guns, airplanes, and tanks. What else? Chemical weapons. Poison gases. Not so much chemical weapons yet, but that's very close. Poison gases have been developed, which is chemical weapons, but not to the extent we see today. Submarines. Submarines. That a girl? And one more, because in the Civil War we had long-range artillery called cannons. cannons, but these now, this long Longer range artillery is going to have the ability. So long range artillery, not cannons, but long range artillery is going to allow some, you know, projectiles to be shot a lot farther distance than in the future. So poison gases, submarines, tanks, airplanes, machine guns, and long range artillery were just six examples of modern technology that had been developed during that 99 year period of peace that would enhance the ability of one human being to kill another. Now, of all these we mentioned, probably the most dramatic killing weapon was the machine gun. Now, you have to remember, kids, that the rules of war aren't going to change much, really, from the American Revolution. The only change we had is when the Confederates kind of cheated, right? During the Civil War, and didn't march head on. But in Europe, they still did that. So, if you're facing each other and machine guns, how in the world are you going to protect yourself as you march? Trenches. trenches. You're going to dig trenches. And that's what they did. They dug trenches, and early in World War I, the biggest battles on the ground were fought using trench warfare, where you would dig a trench and get to that trench, you'd get up and get another trench dug, and you made your progress by trench warfare, trying not to get killed from one trench to the other. Yeah? Okay. How did they like, not get shot when they were building the trench? Oh, they, like, well, they did. Why didn't they just like dig a path straight forward? Maybe they did. Yeah. 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 They had to dig their way. They had to dig their way to the next trench. Yeah, that's a very good point. They dug their way to the next trench, but they still were killed doing it. I mean, that's what happened. Now, the airplane was also used in World War One 
but they weren't very fast or they weren't very maneuverable, which made them very vulnerable. So they were used mainly in two capacities early in World War I. What did they use planes for? Drop bombs. Drop bombs and maybe supplies and wow. observation. Okay? So airplanes were pretty cumbersome early. They weren't very fast. They weren't very maneuverable at the time. They were kind of, well, they weren't kind of, they were very vulnerable. And so early in the war, airplanes were mainly used for observation, seeing where the enemy was, and the dropping of bombs from high distances. Oh, what were the We're going to get to that. You're, you're good. You're good. Now, somebody came up with a great idea of maybe we could use these airplanes as fighting machines, and so we you know what they did? They mounted machine guns on them, and they could be used in that manner. The problem was our technology wasn't tremendous yet, and these machine guns were not synchronized, which means they shot their own propellers off in many cases. So a lot of the deaths from war, war planes fighting was in fact self-inflicted that they had shot their own propellers off. So that had to be corrected. What? No, no, they're not. But then you know, zoom in. Well, the problem was they were shooting off their own propellers because the machine guns were not synchronized to shoot between the propellers. That later happened. They did get that figured out, but early it did not. Now, that's hard to believe, but it's true. All right, now we're going to answer Naya's question, and we're going to go to European alliances and the spark that helped set off World War I. European alliances and the spark that helped set off World War I. Now, in June of 1914, these five major countries of power in Europe